going on, everybody? Welcome back to Think Outside the Blue Box podcast. I'm Anthony Rivera. Welcome back. This is a new year, a, a new uh, direction for the podcast. Today, I'm actually joined by a very special guest. I'm super excited to get into this conversation, uh, Miss E. Veal. Uh, welcome to the show, Miss Veal. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what, what you kind of do, and well, we'll just dive right in. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. First off, I am Evil. I am, I love to call myself a data uh, activist. I am a believer in data and, and the good and the bad that it can do. And so anything that's data specific or driven, I am involved. Um, currently, I am doing work in AI. And so, yeah, that's kind of the long and short of who I am. Data is they, they call it the new gold rush because mm. instead of, you know, physical gold, yeah. now data is, is the, the commodity. So what, what kind of things have you done with data? So I, I work in data and I, I do a lot of data monitoring right now, but what I am focused on is understanding the integrity and the quality of data, understanding how data is being used, whether it's uh, socially or if you're using it for like I said, good or evil. And I'm very fascinated about the different ways that corporations have decided that they're going to use the data that they've been mining for a while and present it to the world, to the users. Yeah, no, I know. I heard one of the other podcasts that you've been on and you were talking about how uh, even social media, when they, when they have those facial uh, filters that, you know, you're basically looking at your phone straight on and, and you were saying that it's kind of like they're collecting that data for facial recognition and, and for different things. Why don't you go a little bit into that? And it's every time I get on social media, there's always this new thing that like makes me cringe. But um, <laughs> the more data they, they collect, the more they realize that they have gaps in their data. And one of those gaps is that they don't have a lot of diversity in what types of facial images that they have. And so a nice fun way for them to collect that data is for filters. These filters, uh, in order for them to place one on your face, it finds all these data points on your face and then creates this image around it. In order for them to do that, they're they're collecting this data. They're, they're uh, taking images that you've already uploaded to these social media platforms and they're reconstructing your face so that when you do put your camera up, it's more accurately describing who you are as a person. And, and when I was saying like, there's not a lot of diversity in the data, especially for um, black and brown individuals, there's not a lot of imagery. When you Google man or woman, it's usually someone of a lighter skin tone. And so these are nice, fun ways to get more people of color to to give away their imagery so that they can collect this data. And, and it's there's good and there's evil. So I, the way I'm presenting it makes it sound like it's bad, but it's good because it, it allows for other tools to be better. In the UK, they had this facial recognition tool that was monitoring the streets and individuals were being over policed because they didn't have a lot of data for individuals of darker skin tones. And so it was just kind of labeling everybody. And, you know, black and brown people are already over policed. And so this just did not help with like camaraderie of the people. Um, so in order to help mitigate that, they need to get more images of black and brown individuals or people of darker skin tones, actually, in order to help those systems assess situations better. Yeah, because you, you're, the algorithms are only as good as the data that you feed it. So if you're, if you're feeding it data, I think I heard you say, if you feed it data that's been, you know, historically biased towards a certain number or a certain group of, of individuals, then the AI is, is, we don't see that anymore because our biases are like baked into who we are. But the, the data shows it and, and the AI is, is not going to hide from that. Like if, if they see, a, you know, when, like you said, if you search for man, it's going to show you white men because that's, you know, it's in the data. Correct. And, and it is, like you said, the data is what it's being trained on. 
Um, and so you want to make sure that data has integrity and that it's quality. So you just can't just throw anything in um, and think that you're going to be able to get like exactly what you're looking for. You can't have blurry in images in. And so you have to go and sweep through the data in order to make sure that it's exactly what you want your, your systems to be trained. on. Yeah. So l let's take it back a little bit. In, okay. in your opinion, because now AI is, is basically being used to mine that data and use that data productively and, and in different creative ways. Uh, but I mean, the data that's been collected since, you know, MySpace, <laughs> it's still out there. So there, there's just too much data for a human to go through it. But now AI is actually going through it. In, in your own words, what is AI? What What is, <laughs> let's get into that. Great question. Um, so First and foremost, there is no actual definition of AI. Yeah, and, I always I always tell people that the word intelligence is a little misleading because it's not intelligent. It's just it's not. It's it's not and and there's different levels. And I'll answer your first question and kind of deviate from from there. So yeah, first and foremost, there is no official definition of um, artificial intelligence. However, my definition is that it is taking your data and automating patterns based off that data. So that is generally what AI is. There's different levels. Um, there is artificial narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and artificial super intelligence. Right now we are in artificial narrow intelligence, which means that it can do basic things. It's the chat GPT of the world, right? It's really basic, but when you get to artificial general intelligence, which there is no definition for any of these words, but, um, and, and there's, there's debate over what it truly means, but um, generally what it means is um, artificial general intelligence is that it can explain the how and the why of what it's doing. And super intelligence um, the artificial super intelligence is it's doing more than what a human can do. It is not only processing, creating, it's it is uh, solving problems that we've never solved before. And we are not anywhere near the super intelligence and we're not at general intelligence. What we are at is this interesting space called artificial broad intelligence. It's, it's more than narrow, not quite general. It's just kind of in the middle of there. Yeah, and there, there's still a lot of things that you, even at this stage in AI that even the programmers that that made this quote unquote AI that they don't understand how when they kind of let it learn on on this massive data set and they just ask it certain questions they can't tell you how it came to that. That's uh, yeah. I think the the term is the black box where mm -hmm. even even the, the the programmers who made it don't understand how it works. Right, right, absolutely. And it's it's because it's like it's learning from itself is it's based on neural networks and neural networks is it was born from the idea of how your brain, your actual brain works, where it kind of connects dots from each other. And um without like going into the math and the science of it all, it it basically just takes parts of a concept and breaks it down. It keeps breaking it down to the most minute. Uh, form and then connecting it to the next part and then connecting it to the next part. And that's basically what our brains um, do. We don't realize it because we, it's just such a, a massive and, and intelligent thing that happens, but it, it's just that we take these small steps of, I know what Brown is. I know what a person is. I know what a person is like you can put these concepts together and that's basically what happens with these neural networks and that exactly what you were saying like because it's doing all of this the people that's building it don't really understand exactly how it's getting to it and that's what's called explainability not understanding the explainability of it all like you said the black box where you can't really say how it made this decision. That's a little scary because if it is making decisions on say hiring and you can't explain how they selected this person over these people, then you got a problem. It's more than just like, oh, you just like discriminated. It can be a financial problem. It can be even bigger and exacerbate from there. 
Yeah, and that's why it's so hard to regulate. It, it's funny to see these uh, politicians try to, you know, try to control and put put the cat back in the box per se, and they, they really can't because they don't understand how it actually works. You know, it, it's just something. It's it's a website that I go to when I just type in it. It, does, it doesn't. They don't comprehend how it actually works. I mean, the, even the programmers don't comprehend how it works. So, and and I mean, and that is the part that they want to regulate because it's it's scary. It's kind of like it kind of go on piggybacking off of what you said, you can't put the cat, cat back in the box. And I know a lot of people are afraid that it's going to become sentient and that we're going to end up in the iRobot or the Terminator. The Terminator, yeah, I've right. heard that so many times. <laughs> and it's like, while that is, honestly, it truly is a future, not necessarily a, a near future, but it is a future that could possibly happen. But the long and short of it all is we can't put the cat back in the box. So there's a lot of people that are resistant to AI and it's futile. Like you being resistant doesn't really matter because it's here and we have to, we, we have to just adapt to it. When it comes to regulations, there's two, there's a lot of sides of this whole thing when it comes to regulations. You, we do want to put boundaries on it because we just don't want the terminators of the world, right? We don't <laughs> yeah. want that. Right. But we also don't want to stifle innovation and putting regulations on things stifle that we can make broader regulations, compliance suggestions and things like that so that there's a window that you can work within. And, and what I mean by that, for example, is if you're if what you're creating is going to harm someone, you cannot create it. I think that that makes sense. Like, yeah. and, and harming someone like in a like killing them type way or if if it does do that it needs to have a kill switch like a manual kill switch and i think that those are regulations that we should probably have I agree. Um, but when people think regulations they're thinking something like it has to be like this and put it in and and that stifles the innovation of it all and even if the u.s were to put those regulations who's to say that another country doesn't have those regulations and they will do the same thing. One of the things that I, I did read recently is that currently, um, I, I believe it's NVIDIA, they have like the best uh, GPU processing um, chip and it has been, they, they have been forbidden to sell it to China. And it's just like, okay, I like, I get it, but it just makes them want to build this this processing chip all they have to do is re-engineer like reverse engineer this processing chip but it does slow down the process of like what they can do in their country whatever it is that they're planning to do but it is interesting that it's like what the regulations are and what they're going to be it's it's been a journey yeah, I mean, and it's been like that with any new technology, right? Like mm -hmm. even the internet, people were freaking out about it because, yep. you know, it's going to, you know, everybody has this Hollywood idea of what, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, I always say the human race is very, very uh, short-sighted. We, we can't look past a certain, you know, a certain time. Uh, we're, we're very kind of embedded in our own society in, in a sense, and we, we can't look past our immediate future uh, if you go back and watch some of the, the videos of when the internet first came out, they didn't call it the internet. They just called it the internet. And they, yeah. it was this, this, this abstract concept that people really didn't know how to explain to you. I think we're going through that again. Yeah. Uh, and, and with any revolution, the smartphone revolution, when people, you know, originally rejected it, said, why do I need that? You know, I have a computer, but now it's like, you can't live without it. Correct. So it's like, I think we're going through another revolution. People are even comparing it to like the invention of fire, not the invention, but the discovery of fire yeah. for the human race. Like it's going to ex ex exponentially evolve us in ways that we, we currently don't understand. Absolutely. That's exactly what's happening. We're, we're seeing the, the precipice of the, uh, of AI and historically all we've ever heard about AI was it's the doom of society right and so of course exactly what you're saying they can't see past what it can do and only have this image of what what hollywood has has presented it's it's kind of like people being shocked that like kenya and africa like has all this like technology because you only know what 
you've been presented on the uh, on on TV, but but just like the like you said, the smartphone, like the iPhone, the first iPhone that came out was revolutionary. It was insane. Like the touch, the eye, like touching a screen, like doing, that was revolutionary. But if we were to go back today and look at that phone, we were like, what is this trash? Yeah. (laughs) What were we thinking? Why was this, why was this big stuff? Like, why was this it? And that's exactly what's going to happen here. Like we are kind of freaking out about chat GPT and it's the new, you know, the new hotness or whatever, but we're going to look back in 15 years and be like, why did we ever think <laughs> that this was technology? <laughs> right? Yeah. I have a feeling like in 10 years, we're going to look back to today and be like, why were we so afraid of it? Like, why, why? why were people so resistive? Like it, it's helped so many things and so many developments and research. Mm-hmm. There's there's a few things I want to get your your take on this. There's mm-hmm. it, It's a phenomenon called hallucinations and mm-hmm. it's it's unintended consequences of the AI that we built because we don't understand it. We, we kind of put it out there into the world. Open AI is one of the biggest companies now, almost bigger than Google. There was a former, the former president of open AI actually did a uh, research project before, before any GPT or anything. And there was, it was a boat racing game that they were kind of training this AI on and they said okay try to figure out how to get the most points in this mm-hmm. boat racing game and after you know a couple hundred iterations of, of playing the same level over and over and over again it figured out that finishing the race doesn't give you the highest score mm-hmm. so what it ended up doing is it ended up uh, kind of circling a specific area because it kept respawning you know power-ups and things so it kept doing that and it found that that's the way to get the most points <laughs> we would have never thought about anything like that. <laughs> so um, so you actually in- introduced two terms. One is hallucination, but then the second, what you ju- that story that you just described, that's deception. And okay, so okay. deception is exactly what you just said, where it's the the goal is get the most points, but we have an idea of what that looks like. And what that path should be. But then what ends up happening is exactly what you just said. The computer outsmarts what your intended outcome was. Yeah, because we told it, we told it the highest points, not right. finish the race, not finish <laughs> which is a given race. for us. Like for us, I mean, you have to finish the race, right? Right. You go through the race <laughs> to get the most points. Yeah. And so it's like making sure that your intended outcome is exactly what the program is programmed to do. And that is that that is a field that's not very well researched right now. Things like that, that whole like deception and and uh, just trying to outmaneuver what the intended outcome is, it is something that needs to be looked into further because there's so many different ways that that can happen. And then you don't want something like the the computer system to just um, try to upgrade itself by writing its own code, hiring TaskRabbit to come and upgrade its like CPU or whatever it is. <laughs> like, it's, And so you just want to look out for all of those things. When it comes to hallucination, a lot of that mostly happens with... Uh, with generative AI, where it's really just trying to predict what the next word is. And because it's doing that, it'll start off one way, but then it'll find text from something else and then add that in. And then you have this like weird sentence that doesn't make any sense, like grammatically maybe, but (laughs) it's like the sky is blue, but on TV, like what? No, none of that makes any sense. Yeah, and so right. that's where that hallucination comes in. Um, and we're seeing a lot more of that. Um, if especially students are seeing it more when they're copying it from chat GPT to turn in their assignments and their teachers like, this don't even make sense. At least a read like it. You made first. that up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the AI just made stuff up. I, yeah. I saw that there was a, there was an actual lawyer that printed out some legal documents that he generated using chat GPT and the judge looked at it. It was like, you didn't make this, did you? Because <laughs> part of the bar exam is this, like the, the, what you put on there is doesn't even exist or it's not even a law that it was quoting laws and, and previous cases and stuff that 
had never had never existed is this thing yeah and there's like citations from papers like that just don't exist because they're like okay the next word that comes after this is usually this and it just kind of makes up something and so yeah that's uh, people are learning the hard way <laughs> about hallucinations now is there a way to like you said kind of put some guards around that where there is some sort of fact checking uh that that happens before it because i i do compare chat gpt to autocorrect it's just autocorrect on steroids right so it's like has all this knowledge and stuff but like is there is there a way that we can eventually get rid of those hallucinations um right now no um like you said it is it's all built on the data that it's trained on. And when it's trained, it's very hard to untrain it. It takes a while for it to like to remove any biases, any information that disinformation, things like that. And so feeding it more data just makes it that much more wrong. Yeah. And so it's like um it, it it also like when it comes to like deep fakes, like there's no way to easily find or identify what a deep fake, you know, deep fakes, unless they're just really bad, right? But for the most part, there's no preemptive way of finding out to preemptively fix these things. They will be in work. Uh, researchers know that they exist. Um, but currently, yeah, we just got to live with it. This is the iPhone one. Of yeah, the iPhone. this is the MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> It hasn't it hasn't uh, matured yet. Yeah. So yeah, going going back to the deception, uh, I think that there's another example that I had on here where um, the AlphaGo, where Ooh. Google Google's original AI had it play a game called Go, and if if you guys are are familiar, it's just a bunch of little squares. I, I don't know. I don't necessarily know how to play it, but it's really complicated. There's only I there's like, like I was about to say what it is. I don't yeah, know. No. <laughs> So, yeah, it's a game that, that there's like there's more atoms in the universe than there are moves in here in, in the game. And they actually had it, you know, learn from different games that had been played professionally. You know, these guys are like, this is all they do. And they the, one of the competitions that they had, uh, they call it move 37, because at the 37th move, it made a move that literally everyone around thought that it was going to be a mistake because a, a professional player would never make that kind of move. Mm -hmm. But it turned out later on in the game that it made sense. It made it a winning move. And that that's one of those like deceptions that we were talking about where it's like us as humans, we have all these preconceived notions of what should be and what a good move looks like. But computers don't care about any of that. They look at the data as it is raw and then they figure out the best, most efficient way of doing things. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Yep. That is a perfect example of like, it's not necessarily being smarter than a human. It's just doing something that a human would have never done. It, it, it's, it is just taking a path that we haven't taken before. It's in situations like that, that opens our mind to other uh, opportunities, uh, other outlets in, in which we can solve problems and other ways that AI could be useful. And so it's it's in that context when researchers or scientists or whatever, they need to process something hundreds of thousands of times, they'll use AI to simulate what those processes would look like so that they can narrow it down to whatever it is that they need. Instead of having to do something 15 million times, you only have to do it 50 times. And I think that that is one of the great things about AI. Yeah, because it... it it gets us out of our own heads, right? Like yeah. if you get a group of a hundred researchers, they're all going to have that bias. They're all going to think that same way, but an AI is not, it's just looking yeah. at it from a fresh point of view. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's, it is the historical bias is that group think it is everyone we, not realizing that because somebody told us a long time ago that that wouldn't work. We're never going to try it again. I, it's kind of like when I was a kid, I, hated strawberries and I hated peaches and <laughs> I couldn't remember why. And I was like, try it one day. And I tried, I was like, what have I been doing my entire life? <laughs> I'm eating these things. And it's like, it's just stepping outside the box. Huh? And uh, <laughs> I love it. stepping outside the box and like, and just trying something else because 
figuring out what the intended outcome is and, and going and, and trying to solve for that. So it, it's helped so many different industries. I, I saw that uh, there was a lot of uh, medical uses for it because, you know, uh, especially like folding proteins and things like that, where it's taken us so long because it's a really, really complicated problem, but computers can do it in an instant. Honestly, today, that is one of the most revolutionary things that AI can do. I, I'm working on my PhD right now. And one of the great things that uh, there's a few tools that's out there where you can, one of the things that you have to do as a researcher is to synthesize the problem or synthesize all this research. So you're supposed to read all these different papers and then come up with like your own definition of what something is or whatever it is. And so instead of me reading all these papers, I can put it in AI, AI can read it and tell me what like and synthesize it for me. I still have to understand the context and understand like what's going on or it can like sum up all of these papers, whatever it is. And, and it just, it makes me more productive. And I think a lot of people right now are thinking that AI is just going to take away all of their jobs. And, and right now the AI that it exists is going to make jobs more productive and efficient. Yeah. I think I heard you say in the other podcast, if you're not using chat GPT to write your emails, you're wasting a resource. I a hundred percent believe that. Like I, I, I try to put like my spin on it, but I'm just, especially because I am rude as hell and, <laughs> and I know like it, it comes off wrong and I just be like, make this nice, please. <laughs> like, please put some kind words into this or like make this, uh, or if I have to send something to like a, a large group of people and I don't want to like embarrass myself or whatever I'll I'll do that it also like if you're not using it for like outlines or writing proposals or coming up with like an outline for a powerpoint it like business proposals things like that like it's been done and there's it swept the internet and you don't have to start from scratch and and that's basically what I'm saying I'm not saying like use it as is, I'm, I'm saying use it as a starting point. As a tool, um, yeah. As a tool. It's so many things that already exist. Someone's already been there, done that. If you're going on a trip and you are like, I'm going to Greece and I need to, for five days, what should I do? Give me an itinerary. A itinerary with a budget of $500. I don't know where you're going to Greece for $500, but <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, I know. It'll help you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I actually use it a lot. I, I, I tell people, I don't think a piece of tech has ever taken over my life so quickly than AI. <laughs> I, I have been immersed in AI for so long. Like I thought that I was, it was going to be a fleeting like thing. And I was like, eh, once I learn about what it is, I'm not going to want to know anymore. But there's so many different avenues that you can dive into and that's what the problem is now where i'm just like oh shiny thing oh yeah. shiny thing oh, <laughs> I want to read about this and i end up like in these deep deep holes <laughs> like and i'm i have to tell myself you have to eat now Stop. yeah <laughs> it's like it's i picture it kind of like that dave Chappelle crackhead meme where he's like oh. give me give me some more of that ai give me <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Every new oh, version of ChatGPT, I'm like, okay, what what can you do? What can I do with it? It's it's insane. Like I feel myself getting excited when a new person I talk to is like, oh, I want to know more. I'm like, oh, God. yes, oh, God. me too. I want to tell you. I want to tell you. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, calm down. Calm down. <laughs> yeah. Because so. you know, like you've used it, you're immersed in it. There's a lot of people that reject it, and that that's. That's one yeah, of the... and it, it, it it's definitely an opportunity to educate people and to <clears throat> to take away any fears that they have and to show how like it's positive. And so that's one of the, I am a naturally like negative person, and I like the negative side of things. And so if I talk negatively, that's because that's where I live. <laughs> you need um, Chat GPT for that. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's where I live. But um, I try to find the positive things because I know. I know more about AI than most people that I'm around. 
And if I'm going to have these conversations with people, I can't scare them. I have to make sure that they understand where the where this technology is going, how it's beneficial for them right now. And, and just to ease the like the angst of it all, because it if your only introduction to AI is Terminator, is the Matrix, is like iRobot or whatever these like shows are, then of course you're going to be terrified. Of course you're going to be like, I don't like it's going to be a dystopia tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And and so yeah, just making sure that I'm a resource for people for the good and the bad. Yeah, you can show them the power of it, how you can use it as a tool. Because a lot of people think it's going to replace jobs, but I think it's going to enhance jobs. Yeah, like coding. You know, now you can use the the um, what is it, the GitHub AI, mm-hmm. and it'll it'll suggest you know code to fix your code, and it's like yeah. you can use that as a tool. It's not like the AI is going to come up with an an app and code it one hundred percent by itself and publish it and make money. And no, it it's still the human doing that. You're just using the AI as a tool to, as a superpower, I say. Yeah. And, and I think the, today, one of the smart parts of using AI to enhance is what is it that you bring to the table? Like, and and it helps to bring that part out of it, out of you, because if you think that this system can just code, then what else are you bringing? What, what knowledge do you have that this AI can't replace? And um, I don't think that AI is going to replace our programmers because there are things, um, proprietary things that you just can't throw into AI and or into these like co-pilot machines or whatever. Mm-hmm. You have to understand how it how it ingrains into your organization, your system, things like that. Like there is another the context. Structure. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, I think that it'll make us better as humans just to uh, for our value and, and, and what we're being valued for. Today's episode is proudly presented by Audible. Whether you're on a quest to broaden your horizons or eagerly searching for your next captivating summer read, Audible has the world's most extensive collection of audiobooks and podcasts. For a limited time, we invite you to sign up for a 30-day complimentary trial, which includes a free audiobook that's yours to keep, even if you choose not to continue with the subscription. Visit audible.blueboxdigital.com or scan the QR code on your screen to start listening today. We also now offer subscriptions with perks. You can get these episodes without ads, behind the scenes, private live streams, and so much more. Head over to support.blueboxdigital.com or scan the QR code on the screen to sign up. Help the show grow and become part of the Blue Box family. Thanks in advance for your support. Now back to the show. And now now that we've talked about the good parts of AI, let's <laughs> let's switch gears and talk about the bad let's things do that AI does. Because I, I know that this is a, this is a research uh, a topic for you. Um, the biases that are in the data that are being fed into these AIs. One of the uh, examples that I kind of got with uh, Amazon in 2014 actually tried to use it for their hiring process. And almost immediately they had to stop because they started to notice that it was only hiring men. Mm -hmm. It was only hiring white men. Mm -hmm. It was only, you you see what I'm saying? So it's like, it looked at the history of Amazon uh, uh, hiring and their HR database and everything. And whether it was intentional or not, the biases are in there. So when the AI sees that and they said, okay, well, the majority of the people who did get the job are men. So let's, let's kind of weed out some of the women and let's hire more men. And, you know, it it kind of used that bias inherently, like there's, there's no way around it. So they, they had to stop using it. Yeah, it and and I think you said the term earlier. Um, it's algorithmic algorithmic bias, and that is the the system is only doing what it's programmed to do, which is take the data that it has and tell you what See patterns, patterns. It found. Yeah, <laughs> what patterns it found, and here are my rec- recommendations based off of historically what has been what what you've hired and what's been successful in the past. But if historically especially in the U.S., right? Historically, our past has been mostly white males in a lot of positions. It weeds out women, disabled people, people of uh, different economical background, things like that. 
And these systems are just weeding out people unintentionally. Um, and that's why you want to make sure that you have a human in the loop in order to recognize these things. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the the that Amazon program was never released. I, I, I believe they never actually hired anybody based on it. Okay. Um, I, I believe that they recognized that it was doing that, um, but they never actually hired anybody. Oh, good. And, right. <laughs> but it's understanding like that that is a smart tool. However, you it doesn't have the data in order to make it a a useful tool, right? And so there's lots of bias in in the data. And so kind of like we were talking about at the very beginning, facial recognition, there's not a lot of uh, images. Like even if you're looking for like photos of hands, hands holding things, you don't see people of color holding things. And it's just like, you don't recognize how little or how, how much the majority is is white until um, until the AI you, spits it right back in your face and says <laughs> right back out at you. You're just kind of like, oh, like, okay. Oh, so there is bias. <laughs> all right, all right. So and and it was a it was a big thing with Google um a while okay. back. So a lot of people don't realize that like AI has been around for a long, long time. But before it was called AI, we all really understood it as algorithms. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Right? Yeah. Same thing. And so like Google search algorithm back in, I want to say it was like 2009 or something like that. I don't know the exact date, but um, whenever you would type in Asian women, it would bring up porn sites. Like that would be the first things that it would bring up. Oh, wow. Or if you put in black girls, same thing. And it was just like, huh. So every time anybody puts in Asian women, they're looking for porn or anytime they're looking for. And so what the algorithm was trying was doing was it was marketing towards the majority. The majority is white men. It's that white male gaze. Whenever you see a lot of like television shows where the white man is is like uh, he's like the hero and he has the best woman and blah, 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 blah. It's like these really masculine shows are masculine things. And that's where historically corporations were like, this is our market. This is the only thing that matters. These are the only people that have money that can do things. And so we're going to gear everything towards them. And so it took a while and it took a couple of like uh, complaints for, because Google was trying to say that it was based off of uh, clicks. That's why Asian women and, and black girls always brought up porn sites, but what they learned, what was learned was that they could manipulate their algorithm. So they didn't do that. So if you try to go right now and type in black girls, you'll get black girls code will be the first thing. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just, um, the algorithms can be manipulated. They can be changed. Um, for, and that's them scrubbing that information so that it can stop doing that. And in that sense, and so I, I think that, I think since 2020, they're starting to recognize like people of color exist and that, you know, we have like a say. And so um, they're trying to fill those gaps and that's where those filters come in. That's where they're trying to find all of these different ways to collect your data um, to fill that gap so that they can fix their algorithms so that they can have a hiring process that actually works. And, and there's lots of things like, uh, one of the things I, I do like to mention when I start talking about social media and negative things is that um, the terms and conditions on social media, uh, they update them all the time. And all we do is like, okay, I okay, agree. Like, so yeah. who is read, who's reading? any of this and <laughs> anyway but the terms and conditions they keep changing because they want to get your consent to use your image for anything and so that's how they're training their models that's how they're training all of this stuff and and training like your your social media feeds on what it is that you like um facial recognition a couple of years a few years ago actually uh, facebook just automatically allowed you to tag yourself in pictures and things like that and they were doing facial recognition with that software that's how it started automatically like grabbing you in different people's picture, they didn't have consent in order to do that. And so they had to update their terms and conditions in order for them to actually be like, oh, we're good to do this. Facebook 
has done some shady things. Oh, yeah. Um, and they, they know, <laughs> they take advantage of the fact that people don't read those. <laughs> yeah, everybody does. And it's like a lot of organizations, they do that. And it's like they Google has done the same thing. Google, mm -hmm. they scan all these books and just had them on the internet for free until somebody started complaining. And then they were like, oh, okay, well, we can't give you the whole book. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's truly, let's do it until somebody gets upset about it. And that's basically what the U.S. does in general. Like, let's just do it until somebody- tells Until somebody them. complains, yeah. <laughs> and then, what, but but by that point, it's like, it's too late, too late. it's blown up, it's a, bigger, it's a bigger ordeal. And even when it comes to like AI policies, the U.S. didn't have anything in place. The EU, they did, and they have pretty, they have pretty, solid policies and then that's when you us was like oh, i guess we gotta have yeah, we gotta keep up yeah i guess so but it was like it wasn't it was for years it took a few years before the u.s actually caught up with like coming up with their own policies i've gone into like three or four different conversations <laughs> no it's okay Okay. They kind of, I, I think in my opinion, I think they kind of have to do that because the, 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 like the AI, when, when chat GPT was first released, people were making malware with it and, and like mm. they were doing malicious things with it. But mm. because there is such a black box on this AI, people don't really know how it works. You kind of just have to let it out, have people play with it, try it, do these things so that then they can go back and, and do. Right. Uh, but there are some things that as a programmer, you should already know to check for. One, so technology in general, any technology, whether it's the telephone or, you know, a TV or whatever, someone is going to find a way to be malicious with whatever the device is, right? Absolutely. They're going to find some malicious way to take this <laughs> seemingly nice thing and be very malicious about it. And that should be, so when people do pen testing, that's when pen testing is penetration testing. That's making sure that they can't um, hack it. So with pen testers, they're the ones that's like, let me see if I can put some SQL code in here. Let me see if I can like find out what, like there are some standard things that you should check your system for. I agree that you do have to release it maybe like in a beta in version. In a beta, yeah. Right. And have people go in and like see if they can break it. That that truly is the the right way to do it where there has to be some type of quality control on it. Of course, there's going to be like, you know, Shavanigan is going to be in some <laughs> some place in his basement and is going to be like, let me see if I can yeah. do this crazy thing that <laughs> no one has ever thought of. And because yeah, uh, when it's being developed, it's such a small group of developers, even with pen testing, there's no way they can think of every single mm -hmm. outcome and, and test every single, you know, correct. thing that it can but do. There, there, there was a there few. Certain, yeah, there was a few things that that even came positively from from that kind of. Uh, when they released chat GPT, they, they never intended it for be a translator, but it can translate. Mm -hmm. It was never meant to be, you know, the, I, I was reading, it, it can do Morse code really well. Like that, it was never trained to do that. You know, it's like all, all these things yeah. that, that, you know, when, when you put it out into the world, you don't think that it, people are going to use it for that. But when they start, you know, typing this stuff into chat GPT, it comes up and says, yeah, it can do that. I, I didn't know about the Morse code thing. I didn't know about the translating thing, but what that translation thing, that's when you need, you actually need more people in the room before you actually let it go. Because who didn't think in the room that there are non English speaking people in the US that's going to use this? You know what I mean? Like yeah. that should have been one of the first things that was like, that should have been a thing before it was released to the public that, oh, I didn't know that it did this, but you should have known. That is making sure that it's inclusive. That is a problem. That's where the AI governance comes in, where you need to have a diverse group of people in the room and not necessarily diverse in the sense of like their race, gender and, and ability, but diversity of thoughts. Because I may not have thought about it, but maybe you would have thought, you know, let me put something in here that's in Hungarian or whatever. So I think that when it comes, especially smaller organizations, when it comes to building te AI technology, they are, they do it in a closed network. Like you said, a small group of people that's doing it. And they probably all have the same thought process. 
right? Yeah, and they all have the same biases. They all think the like you know like minded people and like minded, and and you need to expose it a little bit more. And there, th- but there's a balance that needs to happen, especially within organizations, because you have the balance of the the business aspect of it, where you want to innovate. Innovation brings you money, revenue, but you also want to um, be cognizant of the compliance of it all, because if you're not compliant, then that reduces your revenue. And so there are a lot of organizations that's more willing to, like we were saying earlier, let's just put it out there. Let's just like, and and then we'll, if we get hand slapped, we get mm-hmm. hand slapped. Right. And well, so, people start to complain like, hey, is doing this. Then we'll go in there and fix it. And then we'll do something about <laughs> it. Right. And then we'll build a whole network when <laughs> that compliance and, and the governance should happen. When you think, oh, we should do something AI. Let's get a team of people together so that they are all thinking about this thing from their different perspectives um, and bringing something to the table. Yeah. And, and going going with that, uh, I watched a documentary. I think you, you kind of uh, alluded to it also, the uh, Coded Bias. I yeah. absolutely adore that documentary. <laughs> it was so good. And when, uh, and I don't know if you want to kind of tell the story of the, the, the white mask. Oh yeah. Where... So, um, for those that don't know, Cod- coded bias is on Netflix is a fantastic show. Um, and it was actually like at Sundance and Sundance, uh, Netflix water from Sundance. But anyway, it was a small budget film and there's a student, Dr. Joy. I don't know how to say her last name correctly. It's like Bola Um, <laughs> but I'm gonna call her Dr. Dr. Joy. Joy is good. So, uh, Dr. Joy, she was just doing her research and she wanted to make a mirror that would put filters on her face. And so she was like, all right, let me just do this. She knew how to like code and all of that stuff. And she's done a like some AI stuff before. And so when she went to use this facial recognition software, um, the software didn't recognize her face. And she was like, oh, this is interesting. The last the other software that I used, like an undergrad, didn't recognize my face either. And she, is a, she is a woman of color, just so. She is a woman of color. Thank you for saying yeah. that part. <laughs> She is a black woman. She has a darker skin tone, right? And so she was just like, oh, it's not working. This software that I'm using now is not recognizing me. The one before uh, didn't recognize me. And so she had one of her um, fair skin friends come and like test the software to see like if it was broken and it worked. They recognized her right away. (laughs) She was like, okay. (laughs) She was like, oh, well, maybe it's fixed now. Like, And so she put her face in front of it and it still didn't work. So then she had this white mask because she had just come from a holiday. She was going to a Halloween party. And so she got this white mask and put it in front of the um, the, the device and it recognized the, the, the mask before it recognized her. Wow. And so that's when she realized that the data that these, uh, that the, the model that she was using to, for facial recognition had bias in it where all the data that it was trained on was white male had had fair skin individuals it was also mostly males that it was trained on and so there was bias in in the um the software so she she did go on to do uh research and to see what the other systems that were out there what they were using and how accurate it was it was being and she had to create her own data set label, like if this was a dark skinned male, light skinned woman, whatever it was. And so she made her own data set and so that she knew what was going into the system. And she realized that all of these big name companies had terrible software. And she put them <laughs> all next to each other. And she went to like these big giant conferences. It was like, these are trash. You should not use them. Of course, she ain't say it like that, but yeah, it's yeah. Reason, right. <laughs> and she's just like, they're really bad. Uh, and there were government systems that were using this facial recognition software, policing and yeah, security, like security cameras that have facial recognition in them. And yeah. And it was, they stopped using the system because of her research, but it made some organizations that she named was like, we need to do better. And they fixed the software, 
Um, it did better. It wasn't perfect, but it did better. Yeah. Um, but it it's, it goes to show, one, the power of research, right? And it wasn't that she was trying to expose them in the sense of, like, trying to be malicious. She was just saying, like, these systems are ruining people's lives. And if you want us to use them, we need to be able to trust them. So, Especially if it's making decisions like that, like legal decisions, like, that can affect people's lives. And Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a there is a system where they were trying to see whether or not a person how long a person should go to jail and if they should go to jail or not and same thing the data that they were being that was being put in it was showing that you know black men uh, were more likely to do crimes and so they should stay in jail longer and it would give a, a white man that did the same crime would have a much lesser sentence. And it was just, you know, affecting these people's lives. And and it would say, and the information that was going in, it wouldn't, they weren't collecting their, their race or their gender, but it was collecting like where they lived. And uh, one of the questions that it asked was how many people do you know have gone to jail or have been arrested and things like that. And more black men had people that they knew that went to jail and were in like in these negative si situations. And so if they were judged harsher than other people. And so it's in ProPublica. So it's an article in ProPublica if you want to read it. Yeah, I'll link um, it. I'll link it down in the description. So if so you want to read it. I don't it, know yeah. how I got here, but <laughs> it's about coded bias. And I started talking about Yes. Jail. And that kind of leads us into your research because your your research that you're doing for your doctorates is in data diversity. And and I'm glad that somebody has this in mind, right? <laughs> like we're not we're not just releasing it to the public and leaving it as is. Somebody's actually, you know, figuring right. out I, what needs is, to be fixed. It, it, it it's very important and it's you would think that more people were looking into it and when you, you would think, think about the scale of like how much research is being done how much technology is being put out there the the percentage of who's governing these systems who who cares about the ethics uh, around them it's so low it's so low it's it's to the point where you can probably name everybody that's in that field and I'm just happy to be like one of those people and just being on the precipice of like getting this, this work done. So, yeah. And I, I think you mentioned in the, in the other podcast that uh, you're, you're kind of glad that it's women in at the mm. helm and especially women of color at the helm, because you know, that that's who's mainly being affected by the, these kind of biases. It, 100%. There are a lot of women of color, um, women that's in this field that's looking into algorithmic bias, data diversity, AI governance, and, and just caring about what these systems are doing to the people. And, and this is a very generalized, broad statement, but it's my statement and my statement alone, where I think that it's the, the women are, they care about the human in us and they, they're they're not opposed to the technology at all. They want the technology to be out there. It's just that we want the technology to exist with humans. And in order for that to happen, we have to think about what is going into these systems. And and the first introduction to all of this was um, I read uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. I just reread it because I was like, I knew it was the book that got me into it. And I was like, but why? Because usually when I read a book, I forget about what the book <laughs> was about 30 seconds after I finished reading it. I couldn't tell you anything about it, but I reread it and I was like, oh yeah, this is very interesting because she, she gave a lot of examples about how the data was being manipulated, how it was being, it, it was being opaque and you couldn't see what these systems were doing in order to make these decisions. Back to what you're saying, the black box, right? And and trying to be a little bit more transparent about how we're making these decisions that are affecting people's lives. The, one of the first examples she gives in the book is um, about a teacher, like these teachers were being evaluated. And this uh, algorithm was saying whether or not teachers uh, were doing well in their field. And this one teacher who had, had been like teacher of the year for like three, four years in a row had a poor valuation. And when they asked like, how was I evaluated? You know, what, how did you get to this um, conclusion? They were met with, it's proprietary information. We can't tell you. 
And so that's actually one of the like bigger issues now, because like we have the Googles, the open AIs, the Microsofts of the world, these really big, big organizations that we now rely on Google more than anything, right? To like look up things. And it, it, it seemingly seems like the only like search engine, right? But it, it truly isn't. It's not a mon monopoly, but they have so much power because they have uh, all of our data. They have so much data of ours. So much. And all of the things they do is proprietary because they're a company. And all they have to say to the government is, it's proprietary information. It's intellectual property. We we don't have to give you this because it's our property. We can't. We don't want to reveal how we came up with this conclusion because now we're opening ourselves up to like competitors um, taking over, you know, our technology mm -hmm. and things like that. So that's what we're running into right now. The the legal part of it, where the AI is being built by these companies that do not have to answer to the government and the things that they do are proprietary. It's just amazing what, what, what comes out of the whole thing, like, or where we're going to go, yeah. like, where are we going to go? Like, especially knowing that they're too powerful, period. There's just too yeah. powerful. And they can control the AI, you know, they can build in these things that we would never know that. I think that's why open AI started as an open, that's why open is in their name although they've kind of closed up a little bit now that money's starting to roll in. So money talks. <laughs> yeah. And, so now it's and, a little bit more proprietary than it, it used to be, but that that's the whole reason why I started as an open platform is so people can more transparency. Yeah, and exactly. And now that, you know, Microsoft has given it billions of dollars and it's kind of like, they still are two different entities. Mm -hmm. They're still two different things that uh, they make their own decisions, but I, I believe in their contract, it says that once they hit artificial general intelligence, then they have to uh, renegotiate the contract. Oh, wow. But like I said, no one knows what that actually means. Yeah. Well, thank you, Evil, for, for coming on and talking about the one of the most interesting topics nowadays. <laughs> I could talk to you all day. <laughs> absolutely i could do this all day oh yeah day. absolutely Let, let's leave us with a couple of resources i know you said the weapons of math destruction uh mm -hmm. book uh, I, i'm gonna read that uh the uh coded bias documentary on netflix uh where, where else could people go and, and find more oh great questions um there's lots of books so dr joy she has a book it's called i'm masking ai there are some books by rue benjamin and that i would like to share um Viral justice is one. Um, intersectionality of the internet. I'll give you a list of books. Yeah, <laughs> I'll put them down in books. the description. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some 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 documentaries that I uh, suggest. Um, the social dilemma. It's on Netflix. Uh, that's about like how social media has a lot of your information and what it does with it. What I really like about the end of it is uh, they ask the question to all of the interviewers, uh, would you let your kids get on the internet or get on the on social media? And they all had the same answer. <laughs> it's very interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll send you a list of things um, that I found very interesting. And I think that it will, if, if you're interested in, in AI and governance and I think that these are some great resources for uh, you and your listeners to uh, to go and check out. Yeah, I'm I'm glad that again somebody's thinking about this stuff. Thank you so much for the research that you do and 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 for the the activism that you do and and because somebody does have to do it. And I'm glad you know we have some people out there that are actually doing it. So yeah, thanks again. <laughs> thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This was great. This was fun. If you ever want to talk about AI again. Call me. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll do this again in a few years when AI has had a little bit more time to evolve and, and be more okay. inclusive. And yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have this, we'll chat again. Sounds great. All right, then. Thanks Thank again, Evil.